What do you think of when you imagine a nuclear power plant? The eerie blue of Cherenkov radiation? A delightfully analog control room? My hair? I bet what most people think of is actually this, the nuclear cooling tower. It's a structure synonymous with nuclear power, thanks to their impressive mark on any landscape, and 36 years of Simpsons intros. In the June of 2025, I got the extremely rare opportunity to actually go inside one of these concrete colossi while touring a power plant in Slovakia. In this installment of Expedition Europe, I'm going to use 3D printing, pizza, and Halo to show you just how cool nuclear cooling towers really are. Unlike some of our other nuclear expeditions that start with random emails, I was inside Europe, inside a nuclear cooling tower, because I was invited to speak on two panels at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was humbling, invigorating, and incredibly validating. Except for my opening joke that totally bombed. If you told me that the Thor that you bought off Timu.com would be here at the IEA, I wouldn't have believed you, so thank you. Um, I died of cringe. As an added bonus of being in Europe, after the conference I was able to join a short carpool across the Austrian border to Slovakia for a very special visit to the Mokatsa power plant. After the necessary security checks and PPE donning, our group of industry professionals, nuclear activists, and me was ready to go. After making our way through the sprawling site and making one of my colleagues obviously uncomfortable... Look, you're on camera now. Look at that. Hey, all right. Oh, hell yeah. He loved it. We were finally approaching the cooling tower, one of the many on site. But before we go inside, what is a cooling tower? How does it work? Why is it shaped like that? Why do they get me so ha- Interested. Interested. First of all, it's important to understand that no nuclear power plant with a cooling tower has water and or steam that comes into contact with both nuclear material and the environment. Instead, there are three isolated loops in a system like this. This is a pressurized water reactor. The first loop is the water that circulates through the reactor core as both moderator and coolant. This hot water, much, much hotter than even boiling temperature because it's pressurized, then comes into thermodynamic but not physical contact with water in the second loop. This is where the steam is generated. In this design, the cooling tower is part of the third loop that has yet more water, again not in physical contact, that cools the steam back down. That transferred heat has to go somewhere, and that somewhere is up and out the cooling tower. So the singular purpose of a cooling tower is to reject reactor heat to the environment via a series of isolated heat exchanging loops. The tower doesn't emit smoke, there's no radioactive material, it's just water vapor and a ton of hot air. It's easy enough to understand moving heat through a system like this, but why a cooling tower? Why a concrete tube as tall as a 60-story building? Why does it have that shape? What about this structure specifically makes it good for spewing heat into the sky? To answer that question, we first have to eat some sweet pizza. This is a simple model of your traditional nuclear cooling tower. As you can see, it is wider at the base than it is at the top. It has this bottleneck here and there's also openings at the bottom. Now, this looks simple, but there's actually a lot of engineering that goes into one of these. First of all, the curvature. Why have curvature like this? Why not have just a straight, thin-walled cylinder? Surely that would be easier to build 600 feet of, right? Well, the simple fact is that simple, thin-walled cylinders just aren't that strong. You can get additional strength for a megastructure like this by introducing some curvature. Case in point, pizza. Even if you've never thought about the strength of curves before, I think about them whenever I think of Megan the Stallion. You've used curvature to your advantage. For example, have you ever had a piece of pizza pie that was rather limp? You know that if you add curvature to that pizza, it becomes strong along the direction you want to eat it at. On. Now, we don't, we don't have to get into the intricacies of negative Gaussian curvature here. You just know from years of slamming pie that a sheet curved along one direction gets stiffer 
in the perpendicular direction. That's just something that you know. So let's look again at the curvature of a nuclear cooling tower. Notice how it curves in this direction and this direction. That means it is stiffer along this direction and this direction. Do you know what two forces act along those two directions? Wind and gravity. And so by introducing curvature, your hyperboloid design in cooling towers is strong and stable in a way that simple cylinders are not. And it's easier to build than it looks. One really cool thing about hyperboloid surfaces is that you can create them simply by twisting a plane of straight lines. Now, this is mathematically interesting, but it's also engineeringly interesting. Here is the same cooling tower from before. All I did was remove all the concrete bits. Now, even though this looks complicated, try to find a curved element. You can't. All of this is straight lines. Go ahead, try to find one. You can't, mathematically. Because all of a cooling tower's elements can be constructed via straight lines, it makes all of the construction quite easy. You don't need any fancy fabrication of curved elements. This simple structure means that a cooling tower's design is simpler to analyze and construct. Those are two big reasons why you see these big boys anywhere you see a nuclear power plant. And now, with all of that, it's back to Slovakia. You can understand the basic engineering of a cooling tower, but it's another thing entirely to go inside of one. I asked some of my colleagues, and apparently it's an extremely rare opportunity for a civilian to do what I was about to do. <laughs> There's a big drop right at the start here. It's hard to communicate just how enormous the volume of space inside here is. It's a special experience. We now know what cooling towers do and why they are shaped like that. But how does one operate? Obviously, I was inside one that wasn't operating. So here's how one does run. The floor you saw me walking over is made up of the drift eliminators, there to catch and reclaim water droplets. Under that is where all the hot water from the third loop is sprayed in. It's sprayed over a vast series of slots called fill to separate the water into as many streams and droplets as possible for the most amount of surface area. More surface area, more cooling. That's also why the tower is widest at its base. The deluge of hot water transfers its heat and some evaporated water to the air inside the cooling tower, causing that air to become less dense and rise. Now here's where I actually learned something new. Grady over at Practical Engineering taught me that air with water vapor in it is actually less dense than air without water in it. That kind of broke my brain for a second because there's stuff in the air that should make the air heavier, but nay, dear viewer. Most of what air is, is nitrogen and oxygen. But when you're adding all the weights of these molecules and atoms up, nitrogen and oxygen don't exist as just single N's and O's in the environment. They're actually diatomic, which means there's two of them stuck together. And these two stuck together each weigh more than molecular water. So for the same volume of air, wetter air, air with water molecules in it, will tend to be less dense. So, the hot air with a lot of water vapor in it tends to rise up the cooling tower because of density and accelerate thanks to the tower's bottleneck. This movement displaces the huge amount of air inside of the tower, causing higher pressure air from the outside to be sucked in from the tower's bottom. This simple process can continuously cool the water in the third loop as long as it's being pumped in. This natural convection and counterflow that cooling towers employ is another reason why they're so clever. Aside from water being pumped in, of course, there are no moving parts. It's just thermodynamics, just a big tube that takes in hot water at the bottom and makes clouds at the top. No moving parts means less things that can fail, less maintenance, less cost, and more safety. And the safe operation of nuclear power plants is something that Slovakia 
knows how to do. Another reason why I was in Slovakia was to see the preparation of the final reactor at Mokatsa. Once online, this single core will make Slovakia the most nuclear-powered country on Earth. A full 77% of its electricity will come from nuclear, surpassing France's energy mixture and setting a new world record. It was really cool to be invited inside this plant to see the beginnings of an historic achievement. Of course, not every nuclear power plant has a cooling tower. Many are right next to large sources of water, like a river or ocean, so those plants cool their steam by taking in water from one part of those reservoirs and then discharging it to another part, taking into consideration the environmental effects of locally hotter water. And still other plants cool their steam just with air, without all the cool evaporation stuff that gives traditional cooling towers that classic appearance. And there's one more awesome thing inside of a cooling tower that I'd like to show you. Because they are concrete, because they are so massive, and because they have that hyperboloid shape, the inside of a cooling tower has amazing acoustic properties. <laughs> that is a unique sound that you can't find anywhere else. These echoes are so fun to make, in fact, that I asked my colleague Eric Meyer from Generation Atomic to do me a favor. You see, he's an amateur opera singer, so he needed to, uh, sing the theme from Halo. Um, 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 um. To be inside a nuclear power plant about to make history, to go inside a structure that most civilians can't even get near, are more privileges in this space that I'll always be grateful for. If you've enjoyed this expedition as much as I did, please check out the Makafsa plant's social pages, Eric Meyer's fantastic advocacy group Generation Atomic, and maybe check out a couple of Half-Life histories while you're at it. As long as you keep me going nuclear, I'll try my best to bring you good stories. Until next time.